I'm Jason Jackson, coming to you from Lincoln, Nebraska. Across the country, chief administrative officers are focused on employee engagement and experience and creating engaging workplaces for our teammates. That's this month's focus area. So, hello, Nesca community. We are here today in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm joined by Christy Branscombe, Commissioner of General Services. Christy, hello. Hello. Thank you for hosting us today. Thank you for coming to Nashville. It is a beautiful day here. It is. Um, we may have spent some time in one of your fabulous beer gardens in the city last night, getting to know the place, um, and we've had the warmest of welcomes. It's great. Good. Before we go any further, um, I would love to know how you ended up in this office, overlooking the state capitol here. Yeah. Um, but you're not from Nashville, and you had a career before government. How did you land in this position? Uh, yeah, so that's an interesting story. Sometimes I'm not quite sure how I ended up here. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, uh, yeah, I'm a private sector person and an attorney and had worked in real estate development and construction my entire life. And uh, one fateful day, I got a phone call from an incoming mayor. It was interesting. The mayor of Knoxville went on to be the governor of the oh, state. Yeah. And when that happened, we elected a new mayor, the first woman to be a mayor. And she called me one day and said, hey, I want to talk to you about serving in the administration. And I had met her, uh, ended up supporting her um, towards the end of the campaign, but didn't know her that well. And we were very, very different. And we're still very different. But the idea, I just couldn't get it out of my head. Kept coming back to it and thinking about it and thought if I don't try and just see what it's like to serve in the public service, then, you know, how will I ever know whether I can be successful at doing it? So uh, I tried it, fell in love with it, enjoyed it. I was the deputy mayor, chief operating officer for the city of Knoxville for almost six years under Mayor Madeline Rojero. And uh, as I said, we were very different. She's the known as kind of the very most progressive person you can imagine, pushing Knoxville, Tennessee to its absolute limits. <laughs> and I was seen as the probably more conservative business person, uh, very you know professional uh, life. And and so we came together, and just our personalities and our skill sets really um, complemented each other very well, and just had a great experience there. After I left the city, went to the private sector for about a year and a half, and got a fall, call to come and serve with uh, Governor Bill Lee at the state of Tennessee. Yeah. Same kind of thing. Thought, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to do this again. <laughs> Can I jump back into the public sector? And after a while, just, again, could not get it out of my head and thought, I, I got to go do this. And so I've been here over two years now, and it's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it. Um, I'm sure all of your colleagues in similar roles in other states and territories are interested in this question. Do you think there's any treatment for this addiction? I mean, can you be weaned off? This? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I think you can be weaned off of it, but I do think you have to kind of get your fill. I think you have to you have to uh, decide how far do you want to go with it. You yeah. know, and 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 as we talked before, you know, do you want to be in the executive branch or the legislative branch? If you're an attorney, do you want to be in the judicial branch? I really have no desire to be in the judicial branch. Um, I, I still like the executive side of government. The legislative branch, frankly, um, so, so that's, a, that's a longer complicated answer probably than I, I need to divulge into right now. I but, love it. Uh, but you've, yeah. you've got a standing desk here that over, literally overlooks the state capitol. So I, you're, I do. you're looking down there and saying, there but for the grace of God, go I right Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know what's beautiful about our state capitol, and I'm, I may get this wrong, but it's like the sixth or eighth oldest working capital in the country. Yeah. Yeah, we were walking the grounds yesterday. Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful, yeah. beautiful over there. Um, okay, so we're talking this month about employee engagement and experience. And being the cynic that I am, it feels like that's the buzzword at the moment. Everybody's talking about it. Um, why does why does it matter? Okay, why why don't people just come and do their jobs, get paid their salary, and then then go? And why does it matter to you as a as an individual? Okay, there's a lot to that. So first of all, I think you really can't have a thriving, successful organization if you do not have engaged employees. And I have seen that here. I've witnessed it over the last couple of years. I think the other thing... Just to be clear, you've witnessed disengaged employees as well as engaged employees. Absolutely. And what are the, what's the cost of that? If I'm a taxpayer of Tennessee, why, why do I care about that? Well, I think, I think you're not going to get the most productive employee if they're not engaged. If they're not engaged, they're not going to have the same kind of results that an engaged employee would have. 
uh, and you don't you're not don't always have alignment over your entire team or your divisions or what your priorities and goals are if you have people who are not engaged and so that's what we really tried to create is uh, alignment of our priorities and goals and make sure we communicate those effectively and that everyone understands the why behind those goals mm -hmm. and that they've had a voice in them as well that they get to participate in developing what our priorities and goals are so but that that why mm -hmm. you think is the thing that really moves people like why are we doing this absolutely you know what was fascinating is that when i first came to state government uh, so we do a third party survey i should yeah. say that first of all a third party survey every year on employee engagement and satisfaction. Uh, the first set of results came in after I'd been in office for about two weeks. So the, the surveys were taken a while back. Yeah. The most fascinating part of that is I learned that so many people, they do their job, they didn't really understand how their job fit into the okay. mission, vision, and values of our department. Then they didn't understand further how this department fit into the enterprise of state government. And so, um, you know, if you have that kind of a disconnect, it's hard to feel really engaged or understand why what you do really matters. So I'm doing this job, but I, I don't see where it fits within the Department of General Services, right. but I also don't see where DGS fits within the wider context exactly. of, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So when you understand the why, and then you understand why what I'm doing is so important and why everybody else is accounting on me, whether it's in this department or across state government. So I think the why is, is is critical. But Tennessee's taking this seriously. I mean, you, you're you up there as one of the best places to work, up there with some of the greatest private sector companies. Right. But this has been going on for some time. This is a long-term journey. It, Do I understand that correctly? Yes, yes, it is. So it really started uh, with the previous governor, Governor Haslam, who was the former mayor of the city of Knoxville. And when he came in, he established the TEAM Act. And the TEAM Act was about really civil service reform. Uh, first, we wanted to re he wanted to reform civil service. He wanted to make it easier for discipline and for termination because he, he also wanted to provide a pay for performance option. Mm -hmm. And so we're a state that has a portion of our salary that uh, is based on our performance. And so that's very kind of private sector thoughts yeah. coming into the public service, the public sector. Uh, he also really believed strongly in leadership development. He'd had some great leadership development opportunities in his life. And when he came in and realized that we didn't have those same kinds of things going on at the public sector here at the state, uh, he decided we really need to figure out how we do that and how do we groom people to be leaders and, and better leaders. And so he appointed the first chief learning officer in the country. And she came in and set up all of these different programs and leadership development opportunities and with a signature program being leader, Lead TN which okay. is a program for all the employees. There's 40,000 employees across the state. And so they can come in and they, uh, you know, get selected for different kinds of leadership programs. And you really see people transform during that process. But you see that as essentially part of people's remuneration. It's part of the package of coming here is that you'll get great professional Absolutely. development. Great, okay. great professional development, great professional support. Uh, and I, I do see that as one of our competitive advantages to make us an employer of choice. No, but let me ask you this though, because tenure is often used as a, as a marker of success. But if you're doing great professional development, you're clearly qualifying people. I mean, part of the attraction is that you're qualified for the next step. Um, put the statistics to the side for a second. Do you like to see people moving in and out of the government sector to the private sector and back again, or would you prefer people stayed here for 30, 35 year careers? Mm, that's a good question. I, I like the balance. I like both, right. frankly, because I have some institutional employees here. They've been here for a long time, and, and I value them because they have seen and heard it all, right? And so right. they can give me the perspective that I can't have otherwise. They're the body of knowledge that says, we may not want to tread here or we may want to go there. Right, or here's yeah. what happened back in this time. And, yeah. you know, the circumstances were different, but I could see some potential pitfalls, so watch out. So I, I like having that, but I also like to have people who have worked in the private sector and, and come in and work in the public sector like me. Uh, that's been very beneficial for me because you kind of talk some of the same lingo with the private yeah. sector people, and they also understand where I'm going and what I'm trying to do when I'm trying to make some changes. Okay. So, all right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put on my skeptical hat again around this whole concept. Um, the state capital is Nashville. Mm -hmm. Nashville. Is, I mean, the skyline is just cranes and construction. You have some of the coolest companies here, and some of the coolest companies moving here. The quality right. of life is is incredible. Right. Um, 
how how is state government as a career going to compete with those companies based here in the state capital? So one thing is that what we've already talked about is leadership development. Okay. I don't know that, I don't know a private sector company that can offer that many opportunities for leadership development, that many different access points for anybody. You don't have to be at the top of the game or the top of the department. Yeah. You can be um, just someone in a any kind of division. Um, you could be delivering mail and you could have a leadership opportunity um, or leadership development opportunity. So I think there's lots of access points for growth. Uh, I think there's also lots of opportunities to move among departments and take different positions and learn different things. And what you learn here in state government translates very well to private sector in lots of ways. I think um, another competitive advantage we have is we've been um, offering alternative workplace solutions for, gosh, five, six years now. We refer to that as AWS. Okay. And really it's about allowing our staff to work in the situation that helps them to best serve our constituents and our citizens across the state. So what might that look like? So it could be in a work from home environment, which a lot of us have been in, you know, right. because of But you COVID. were doing this long before the pandemic. But we were doing this long before the pandemic, which made our transition seamless, frankly, huh. uh, when that happened. But um, AWS allows you to work from home. You might work mobile, you might work on site. Uh, but you're not someone who's going to have to be in the office every single day. And so that has given us a really strong competitive advantage, especially with millennials and that younger work group. Yes. So and now think, is this applying yeah. is this applying at every level? Yeah, absolutely. So this isn't just sort of the people who might be wandering around these these beautifully refurbed offices. This is people who are across the state in different ways. Across the state, uh, yeah, absolutely. In, in every part of the state, we, we provide that opportunity. You know, for a place like Nashville um, and Memphis and maybe even Knoxville and Chattanooga to some degree, it also allows our staff to kind of get that work-life balance back. Right. Uh, you know, we don't live in D.C., and so, you know, maybe we don't know how bad traffic can be, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is bad here. There's no doubt. We've yeah. just had explosive growth, as you just described, and as you can tell, it's continuing from all the cranes. Even the with work from home, as we're currently in, the freeway this morning was, was somewhat was backed up. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so we are working to, you know, catch up with all of that, like every other city in the country to deal with our transportation issues. But uh, yeah, there's some people who, you know, don't make enough money to live, for example, in Davidson County. And yeah. so they live in the outskirts of Middle Tennessee. And so they have quite a commute coming in. And so AWS allows them much greater flexibility. Uh, you know, if you have children at home or children getting out of school or uh, pa parents perhaps that you're caring for, uh, then AWS provides you an opportunity to get your work done on your time and we really just look at outcomes. We measure outcomes. Uh, gone are the days where you think that someone's just sitting at their desk and that sitting at their desk means they're doing their work because we all know everybody's on Facebook half the time. So, <laughs> you know, so that's not accurate. But, uh, but I think we've had a real shift in our mindset in, in the state of Tennessee. And so um, AWS is one of those things that's given us a great competitive advantage um, over other work areas. I want to come back to the outcome mentality in a mm -hmm. second, but I have to ask you, um, have, you, have you enjoyed, for those who are more traditionally minded or are skeptical of AWS, being able to say, actually, this has been an asset to resiliency. You said the transition to the response to the pandemic has been relatively easy because you're already doing this. Absolutely. It's been super easy. We, uh, we've been doing this for quite some time. People just kind of picked up their laptops and went home. They you can work. access everything from home. You work from home. You know, I, I think that it's been challenging. There's no doubt, especially for some of the other departments who deliver services to their constituents directly. You know, we're a shared service agency, yeah. so we play a support role. And uh, our goal really is to help our other departments and state agencies function. And so uh, for us, it's it's really worked well. We've been able to um, do just about everything we've needed to do. We do a lot of real estate in my department and our construction sites have continued on. We've had more ribbon cuttings and ground breakings during COVID than you can imagine. And so uh, really it's, 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 it's been easy for us. Uh, I'm, I'm more, more concerned about the human element than I am the technology and, and the support that way. I'm more concerned about how our people are handling things, how they're dealing with uh, kids being home and, and how they're you know helping their kids learn uh, during this period of time. Um, Is I'm, there a differentiator there, Christy, with, um, you know, even prior to, to COVID-19, there was an increasing focus from 
the more bleeding edge employers to focus on mental health and wellness and you right. saw sort of counselors yeah. in the workplace and that it was already becoming a thing. Is there a way that state government can sort of be a leader in that area? So great, great thought, because I, I have a great answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> There's um, a layup question about yeah. this. We're not going to give her any easy <laughs> Yeah, so so let's just speak to that. In a both a pre- and post-COVID environment, like what does mental health look like in terms of being an employer of choice? So here's something that we do. When when I first got here, that first set of survey results that came back from, yeah. from the third-party surveyor said, um, you know, we need to start our wellness council back. So I went back to everyone and go, so what is the, what is the wellness council? Everybody <laughs> wants that? to do that. And they said it was focused on nutrition and exercise. And I was like, okay, was that it? And they go, yeah. And I was like, but there's a lot more health right. than that. There's mental health, there's financial health, there's, um, you know, relationship health. I said, we've got to expand this. So we changed it to, and we call it now DGS Cares and Connects. And so one of the first things we did is bring in the Tennessee Suicide Prevention Network mm. to talk about suicide, which is a problem in our state. It's an epidemic across our country, yeah. but it's a problem in our state for sure. And so they just came in and talked to us. And we, you know, all of us have been touched by suicide in one way or another, a family member, a friend, a colleague, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, um, so, you know, we had them come in and they talked to us about what the warning signs are, what the myths are, what to do if you think you might know someone who's going through um, some struggles. And so it was very helpful. And, the, and, our, and our group really reacted very well to that. And so uh, we do a financial health one. Uh, but we just really try to defend, d d to expand the definition of health. And because the idea is, yeah, the nutrition and, and um, the physical health, absolutely it's important. But there's so many other things that um, make up who we are as a healthy person. And that health is not only important here at work, but it's also important at home. So we're we're looking at how we continue to expand that. But we have had so many uh, DGS cares and connects virtually now, and we've um, bring in a facilitator sometimes to talk about topics. Sometimes we talk about the topics ourselves. Uh, sometimes is this expensive? How do you how to justify the expense? Of no expense this? to it, really. There's no expense. We we uh, the facilitation. You know, we have experts within state government right. on certain topics that we rely on. Heck, we have experts in our department sometimes. It just amazes right. me. The people around here amaze me at what they can do. And so uh, what they know about and what they can share, their own education. So, uh, no, it really hasn't cost us anything. But, but the mental health piece really has concerned me through COVID. So we've been very intentional about doing other things. We have a, a, a DGS coffee and conversation. We had one in February during Black History Month and our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council and the champions who are part of that group did a wonderful presentation um, on, uh, on black historical figures and especially those here in Nashville and in, in the Tennessee area. And then uh, we had a game to test everyone's knowledge on, on black history. And it was great. We had almost 50 people virtually join that. And so... Choosing to join. Choosing to join. It's all volunteer, okay. right. And so... So there's little things like that. We have a commissioner's roundtable where I try to make sure that I spend an hour every other month with uh, people who are not in the leadership team that, that I need to hear from. I need to hear their feedback because some of them are on the front lines and I need to hear what's going on down there. I don't need to hear that from the 22nd floor. Okay. And so uh, it's just been time with them. And honestly, that's some of my favorite time because it's really good because then they tell me information that they, they're like, Commissioner, I don't know if you know about this. And I've learned several things that way. Yeah. But um, we've done that. We've, we've uh, always do a, a um, coffee for people who come on board, new, new people who are hired. And, and that's a group who have coffee with the commissioner. Yes, have coffee. Yeah. No, that's that's the coffee with the commissioner, right? And then the commissioner's roundtable is the, is the group that just is more of the frontline workers that yeah. I meet with. So um, we have lots of different, try to create, again, lots of different access points for people to stay engaged uh, and, and be feel like they're a part of what's going on. We finished our intergauge survey in January. We got the results back of the 2021 survey about three weeks ago. And the number one statement that the great majority of everyone agreed on is that uh, the, the staff feels very well informed about the big decisions that are happening in DGS. And so uh, that's Do you that's think huge. that's because of uh, a great communication strategy in terms of like emails and PowerPoint slides, or is it because the information's 
transmitting through the organization or was like the virtual it, water cooler? It takes both. Okay. It takes both. You really do have to start at the top though. You have to have to put information that's important to them in news breaks. I sent out DGS all employee emails. Uh, we also of course have our town halls for a year. We have quarterly huddles, which I always am a part of those. We have leadership team meetings. And if I'm an employee of that town hall, I can I can genuinely ask a question from the heart, and my career is not at risk for, absolutely. for asking yeah, the wrong absolutely. question. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And 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 at the end, we always say, "What questions do you have? What can I answer?" Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the the very first town hall actually I attended, getting back to employee engagement was, uh, I told them then and there, I said, "Listen, we spent a lot of time working." And I think we'll work hard together. But the other thing is I want us to have fun. Because if we're not enjoying this, then why are we all here? And I sure don't want to be somewhere where I'm not having fun and enjoying myself. And so I don't think you guys do either. So, um, yeah, so with that and kind of putting everyone's mind at ease, they opened up and started asking me all kinds of questions. <laughs> uh, so at the end of, of uh, if those town halls and the huddles and the meeting, the leadership meetings that we have, you know, I, I answer whatever they want to ask. So, so Christy, you're, you're describing like a jigsaw puzzle where different pieces come together to create the whole employee experience, whether that be um, the ability to work flexibly, the um, community, mental health you touched on, communication, both upwards and downwards, um, and then professional development. You're very clear that leadership development is for all ranks, not just those heading towards the top. But when we flip to competing with the private sector for employment. What about these two tough ones of perks and workspace? How do you compete with the tech companies in town that have the free lunches and the foosball tables and the, the, you know, the free, free beer at the end of the day? I don't imagine that happening in this building. No, but. unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean the commissioner can't take people out after work for a happy hour every now and then. <laughs> so, uh, and, and we have uh, we have that kind of group here. So it, it's that and that helps. And, and as you know, around Nashville, there's plenty of opportunities to go do that right outside the door. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have great benefits. I think that's important for um, for people to understand. I think most state governments, when you have you know, 40,000 or several thousand employees, you have great bargaining power when you're getting benefits. And so we do offer that. And and I think, um, you know, you've seen our state offices. We've made a real yeah. effort at making sure that we have the the coolest, nicest, most fun place to work if you're looking at, you know, just the aesthetics and, and how we work. We have some hard-walled offices, um, just like here in the commissioner's suite. But if you walk around this floor, for example, you saw there are no others. Everything is wide open. And it is, uh, we have a variety of, of ways you can work. You can sit at a desk, you can stand at a desk, you can be in a closed off kind of study carol with just glass walls. You can uh, go collaborate and there's rooms for, for collaboration around. Um, there's long tables where you can spread things out and look at them. But we, our goal is to really be flexible in the workspace and to try to provide a modern kind of cool, fun place to come work. and. And that's what we're doing. And we're going to be doing more of that because, uh, you know, once COVID is over and people start working in this new work environment, I think we're going to need even more of that across state government. One thing we've been talking about lately is providing opportunities for for areas with soft seating, Mm. you know, because people are so used to now just sitting with their laptops, you know, in their their laps. interesting concept and uh, just being able to sit there and kind of brainstorm together and work. So, our objective now is to provide as many different opportunities and scenarios where you can sit together and work uh, because that's really what the future office is going to be about. It's where you come to socialize, collaborate more, um, have meetings when you have to have those in-person meetings, but we need the heads down space. I think we're going to be a lot more comfortable with allowing more and more people to embark uh, on AWS uh, and engage that way. That's and you were on this path already. So mm-hmm. on this issue, yes. in a way, the pandemic has been a gift because it's sort of illustrated to everybody that this is the way forward. Oh, but you were already going that Yeah, direction. you're so spot on though. Okay. You know what's fascinating is, so uh, we have 22 department uh, commissioners here, I believe is the number. And so as you can imagine, uh, not every commissioner has in warmly warmly embraced AWS as others. Indeed. And so uh, we had probably four or five who were just like, you know, that just doesn't work for our department. 
I'm not quite sure it didn't work, but it didn't work yeah. for their department. And <clears> so uh, we all went into this work from home scenario because of COVID. And interestingly enough, about three of the departments who said, yeah, this is just not for us, called me and said, okay, I was wrong. And so they've realized that, that they can work in this setting. Yeah. Maybe not every division within their department, but they do have uh, lots of divisions that are going to go into AWS. As a result of that, we're actually going to be reducing square footage across our state portfolio again and um, we'll be reducing the size of some of these, uh, the real estate footprint for some of these departments. And so that's going to be an uh, interesting effect on our, our real estate portfolio across general government. So, so the to summarize, the pitch to a potential employee is flexible work, really good workspaces that are designed to collaborate and, and do amazing work, um, support on a community, professional development, um, and then a sense of service. So you may not be able to compete head on with um, the private sector over specific things, but the overall package combined with the calling you think can attract the people that you need. Not only Thank do I you. think that I really see that. Okay. I see that happening uh, every day. I, I just am amazed sometimes by the quality of employees that come here. Now, no doubt, Nashville's growing by leaps and bounds. We can't keep up with all the growth, and we have lots of people coming into the market. But as you say, there's lots of employers coming into the market, too. So uh, just every, every time I have one of those coffee with the commissioner um, sessions where I'm meeting with the new employees and typically there's anywhere from six to ten people in that group uh, and they start telling me about their background I just sit there and think how do we find these great mm. people who are coming in here to work but I think there's also they've heard the reputation of working for the state of Tennessee government and, you know it's been going on since you know we've had some great governors really we have but you know when, when Haslam came in in 2011 2012 started making all the changes I mean, that, all those people, it all gets out to the private sector. Yeah. And they understand that, and the private sector are the taxpayers, so they appreciate it as well. And so I think we have a reputation now. I think it's it's almost like it's it's we've hyped it enough, and now it's really real. And, and, and people leave here feeling good about having worked in state government. And the quality of people here, the quality of the commissioners just uh, blows my mind at times. I just, I think, I think, how did we get this person here? And of course... Sometimes, as I said, I wonder why I'm here, <laughs> but um, it's it's the whole sense of giving back and public service and it gets into your blood. And it, that's what amazes me, too, is working with my staff here is I see so many of them who, you know, don't make near the money they should, frankly, and don't make near the money I do. And they're here because uh, they just are addicted to that sense of giving back and doing uh, what they can to make our state better and to make our um, citizens and constituents, uh, you know, as as happy as they can be about those taxpayer dollars that they're paying. We're back to that addiction to public service. Yeah, it's yeah. sad. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great. I love it. Having been a public servant, I, I love to hear it. Um, is So this is a long-term effort. You've touched on needing governor support, but actually multiple governor support to drive this through from Governor Haslam right. to Governor Lee currently. Um, any leadership lessons in terms of driving through programs like this uh, for your colleagues within the NASCA community? Wow. So uh, leadership lessons in general, I've always just tell everybody be open and, and, and learn to say yes. I would have never ended up in public service had I not had the guts to say yes. And I, I don't know if it's guts or if it was it was just, I, I don't know what drove me last time. I think it was just, again, the idea I couldn't get it out of my head. So be open to yes. And you don't know where, where your career and where your life will take you. Uh, regarding how to get a program like this started, you know, here's the deal. You can't hire a consultant to make this happen. You can't, um, you know, tell everybody else to make this happen. It has to start with you, and you have to know in your heart and your head that you're going to make a personal, serious investment in it, and that you're going to be as authentic and real and put as much effort into it as it absolutely takes to make it happen. There's just no substitute. So I think if you really want to uh, change the culture, it has to start with you. It starts with the leader just as it started with Governor Haslam, just as it starts with Governor Lee. Uh, but you have to start it and you have to invest in it and you have to be thinking about it and working on it all the time. Because when you when you lose sight of something like that, it gets off track fast. And then then the, when that starts falling apart, other things start falling yeah. apart. So 
um, my advice is just you have to dig in deep and know what you're getting into. And I, I do think the third party surveying has been really instrumental for us. Um, the, all those surveys that we do um, every year, it's a third party that comes in. I only get aggregate information. I have no idea who says what. And uh, from that information, we see, okay, this is trending well. We have three years of the data now, so we're starting to see trends. You know, this looks good. This looks like really great feedback. This is not as great. We need to focus some attention here. Uh, and then last year, because of that, uh, we were the only state department to get a top 2020 workplace award um, for, from the Tennessean, which is a huge honor. And our data looks even better this year. So hopefully, you know, we'll get even a better award this year. So you're listening to the data, you're doing your roundtables, and you're listening to frontline employees, but then you're throwing your heart and passion into making it your initiative that you're leading from the front. Yeah, if, if, if they don't see that it's real, then it's not going to matter. And, and so right. one of the things we do once we get that data bit back from the employee engagement uh, survey is when we look through it, we have each division develop a group of people, like maybe six to eight, and it's part of a large task force. We call it the Employee yeah. Engagement Task Force. And they really work on what are the top three issues that they see based on the data that are in their division. And so I will sit down and meet with them. We'll talk about it. And they'll, de they'll develop their own plan of action. And we'll talk about it. And maybe we tweak it here and there, but then we'll approve it. And so for the next year, we work on those three things really diligently. And so now what they've seen is that when they prioritize those things, that I don't let the, you know, I don't let too much time go by before we're implementing, implementing it. And so we've made major changes based on the feedback. And so now they know and they have confidence in the fact that if they give us that survey information that we're going to make a change. So you speak, we'll prioritize, and then you'll see us move on it quickly. And that formula then repeats itself. Every year. With greater trust. Right, right. Okay. So. Well, um, I've got one last question. There are many impressive certificates around this office from JDs and, and various other qualifications. Um, but there's one certificate just over my right shoulder for the uh, Knoxville Christie Branscombe <laughs> Day. Yes. Um, let me just say that again. There's a Knoxville Christie Branscombe Day. I've never seen a day named after a government official like this. So what's yeah. the background to that? So um, that was the day that I left city of Knoxville government. And it was a bittersweet day because Truthfully, at that time, um, when I left, everyone thought I was running for mayor. And I thought about it for a yeah. long time. And so uh, the previous mayor, Mayor Madeline Rojero, was my biggest advocate for running for mayor. <laughs> and she really wanted this to happen for me. And uh, so she and I, you know, we talked about it a lot. But uh, in the end, I decided not to do that. But yeah, I think that was part of the, if we give her a day, maybe she'll go ahead and run for mayor. <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but it was just in honor of the service. And of course, there's some funny things in there as well that are interesting. Uh, it was just, it was a great day. It was a great celebration. So uh, yeah, I, I look at that every now and then. It makes me smile. So my new goal in life is to have a day named after me. <laughs> there as you a result. go. <laughs> Commissioner Branscombe, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun talking about this. Commissioner Branscombe has brought to light a variety of action items and tools that can be replicated in each of our states. Successful organizations have thriving, engaged employees who are productive, and we know it's critical to have an alignment of agency goals and a strong communication plan, being able to answer those why questions that motivate your employees. As state chief administrators, lead by example, develop clear rules, listen to your employees, show your appreciation for their hard work, and provide the staff with opportunities to excel. Commissioner Branson gave us many key takeaways, so let's take a look at some action states can consider. Number one, create an environment of trust. People generally want to be fully engaged and committed to what they're doing. They want to feel as if their work matters and they want to believe in the people who are in charge. This contributes to a creation of workplaces built on trust and mutual respect. Tennessee uses a third-party survey or an instrument to query their staff. They ask the team how does their job fit into the mission, vision, and goals of the agency, as well as where does DGS fit into the overall state government enterprise. This is instrumental. Listen to your data. Tennessee pulled the top three issues in each division, then they developed a plan of action around those. Focus on clarity. Clarity in goals, priorities, expectations, and intentional opportunities for feedback. When you have clarity, staff know what's expected and the outcomes necessary to complete those tasks. Number two, provide opportunities for leadership development. 
Tennessee focuses on leadership development, and this started with Governor Haslam, and it carries over today. In fact, Governor Haslam appointed the very first chief learning officer in the country. LEAD Tennessee is a professional development initiative and part of their employer of choice. Take a look at their full program online and learn more about this 12-month intensive and high-impact development covering eight leadership core competencies which builds strength within agencies and creates a pool of leadership talent for the state. Increase leadership opportunities and find those access points for any and all levels of staff. Do that by encouraging staff to grow through networking, which teaches how to forge powerful connections. Provide mentors and other opportunities for deliberate growth. This ensures employees don't get stagnant in their roles. And focus on strengths. Think of this as a way to energize your team. Perhaps you build a, st a strategic thinker with another employee who is an excellent project manager or implementer. Know how to position your staff to enhance and broaden their strengths, both individually and collectively within the teams. And number three, develop multiple access points to build and enhance communication. Create multiple touch points and opportunities for staff to learn and communicate so they feel connected and included no matter what level they are in the organizational chart. DGS Cares and Connects focuses on mind, body, life. Tennessee looks at suicide awareness programs. They have DGS Coffee and Conversation to look at various topics. They have the Commissioner's Roundtable for frontline workers and staff, town halls and quarterly huddles. Make sure in each of your states, your team knows you, want them to find ways to have fun, and truly enjoy their role. Focus on solutions. Building on clarity and strengths when leaders highlight outcomes, there's clarity, high expectations, and quality relationships. Combine these lead to innovation and solutions. T key takeaway number four, focus on the health of your team. We know the toll the pandemic has taken on our country, including each of your team members and senior leaders. It's critical for chief administrators to focus on mental health, financial health, relationship health, and wellness of your team. Expand that definition of health, including health at work and health at home. This can be at virtually no expense when you tap into your own experts. One solution that Tennessee already has in place is the Alternative Workplace Solutions. It's been in place for five or six years now. That was an easy transition for the global health pandemic. In their terms, this is a cultural and physical transformation using non-traditional workspaces to promote efficiency and flexibility across state government. Another vital component is to measure outcomes, not simply the number of hours your employees are sitting at a desk. Focus on those relationships. Creating a positive culture isn't easy when staff are working from multiple locations. However, we know that high quality relationships produce greater outcomes. Find ways to acknowledge your team, plan together, review progress in a virtual world, and use digital platforms to relax and have fun together. Get to know your team on a very personal level. And then key takeaway number five, lead authentically and ignite passion. Authentic leaders inspire trust in their teams. Employees are much more willing to share their concerns, which means those issues are more likely to be resolved instead of lingering or not addressed. Because of these higher expectations, it's vital for our leaders to know how to inspire passion and confidence in the people they're leading. When your staff feel they're walking alongside you, they're much more likely to push for success. In these situations, a spirit of teamwork and loyalty can spread throughout an organization, resulting in high morale and producing extraordinary results. These concepts have to start with you, the CAO, and know that you'll make an investment in your people. Be open and comfortable saying yes. This starts with the leader. Must, you must invest your time in them. Dig in deep. Focus on the purpose. A team that knows its purpose can really innovate, adapt to change more easily, and make stronger decisions. We heard Christy say to us three things critically. Employees speak, leadership listens, change happens. With that, let me again thank Commissioner Christy Branscombe of Tennessee for sharing her story with NASCA members. Stay tuned for the next episode in our monthly Top 10 Priorities for State Chief Administrators video podcast series.